is Ken Spicer. Welcome to Revere Network. Thank you for joining me today. And we're going to continue something we started last week, and that is this concept of healing. And uh, the broader uh, title is Healing and Miracles, but I really want to just camp out here on this aspect of healing as part of our redemption, and that's something that I I delved into last session. So I want to make a couple of uh, assertions here in the beginning, and that is that the gospel and healing are mutually inclusive. That means one doesn't exist without the other. So in our salvation, a component of our salvation is physical healing in this realm, in the earth, in life right now. And I think that we'll see that borne out by Scripture today. Um, So my assertion then is that healing is as much a gift in redemption as salvation is or as forgiveness is. So salvation, to be saved, essentially means, literally means, spirit, soul, and body. So your spirit is the real you, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion, and your body. So, you know, Hebrews 4.12 is very explicit about that. We are made in the image of God, so we know that as He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we also are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And the salvation that Jesus brings, and yes, we will be ultimately completed someday in our relationship with Him uh, via salvation, but even now we have the first fruits of those things in this life. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go to the Word, and I'll go first to Second Peter chapter number 1, verses 2 and 3. And this is what uh, Peter writes. He says, "'Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue.'" So I just want to camp here just for a moment. Now, notice that grace and peace, this understanding of unmerited favor, unearned blessing, unconditional love and acceptance, and peace, the peace that passes understanding, the peace that is deep like a river, the peace that that gives us the ability to, to trust God in the midst of any storm, those two ideas and those two realities are multiplied through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So, uh, Hosea 4, 6 is very clear that my people perish for lack of knowledge. It's important what we know about God and, and about Jesus, and that's why I'm, I'm doing this, uh, this session today and, and, and maybe, maybe a little bit further than today. And that is because many people no longer believe Scripture as literal. And this is part of a literal um, understanding and application of Scripture, that that physical healing like we see in the gospel, like we see in the new covenant, is for humanity today. And that's hard for a lot of people to grasp. And I'm talking about people that love God, who are wonderful folks, who just don't believe God is healing people today. And the biggest reason they think that is because, A, they've never been taught it, and B, they know a lot of great people who also loved God, who also maybe even prayed to be healed, and they died. And so what you have here is you have this reduction of the gospel to our experiences instead of this elevation of the gospel to the Word of God. And again, we've all had losses in this category. And and when I say losses, I mean somebody that dies prior to being 70 years old because, you know, the the Word of God and Psalms promises three score and 10 at least. Uh, I think there's other factors we could look at. And and there's no condemnation. So I want to get that, you know, said right away. There's no condemnation here. This is an opportunity to learn. This is an opportunity to grow in faith and our trust of Scripture, our knowledge of God and of Jesus, and then grace and peace will be multiplied to us. And then it goes on to say that He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. So again, we have this knowledge of God and His goodness and His fathership over us. And as we really dig into that understanding, then we have this this revelation, if you will, of life and godliness that God has made available to us. Now, if he's making all things that pertain to life available to us, then um, life certainly means health 
and and it certainly means you know not sick so god has a plan for us and I'm interested in trying to live that plan out in its fullness. And I know a lot of things war against this mentality. Here's another reason why I think a lot of good people struggle with the idea of healing. And that is because from the time we are born in this world, we are taught to have faith in sickness and in disease. How many times do you know someone who is told by a doctor, you've got X amount of months to live because you've got a certain disease or you've got a certain disease and nobody survives this. This is fatal. There's, this is untreatable. This is incurable. All those kind of things. We are taught to have great faith in disease and great faith in sickness in order to, to die on cue. And so many times doctors have told people, look, you've got three months to live. And I'm telling you, uh, in three months, those people typically are dead. And, and because they have faith in the doctor, they have faith in the words of the doctor. And many people take that to heart. So again, there's no condemnation. My own father died at 62 with a disease that was incurable. And he was on chemotherapy for four straight years. And of course, you know, he, he's a generation ahead of me. And I would ask him after his doctor visits, hey, what did the doctor say? Well, he didn't say anything. Well, what did you ask him? Well, I didn't ask him anything. I just figured if he wanted me to know something, he'd tell me. And so this is this blind trust that I wish we had in God. And I, and look at my dad was saved. He's in heaven right now. I'm going to see him again someday. So my heart's happy when I think about where he is, but he died young and he could have still been around, you know, for his great grandkids. So all I'm saying is this, is that we are facing an adversary who has gone all in on killing us and all in on robbing us. And of course, Jesus said that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but that he came to give us life and life more abundantly. Now, if abundant life is something Jesus is continually giving, then I promise you that includes physical healing. And God is never going to go crosswise of his word. And so God never has ever told anybody that he's not going to heal somebody. And I'll tell you why, because he's already healed us at the cross. So I have said on here that, you know, it's not necessarily biblical to ask God to heal us because we're already healed. I don't think God's a nitpicker, but I think that if we understand it in the proper context and way in which the Bible uh, displays it and, and teaches it to us, then I think that we, what would be more accurate and what would be more uh, encouraging to our faith is to thank God for our healing, even when we don't feel well. Now, you may call that denial. I call that faith. Uh, And so, again, I don't want to digress here. I don't want to get into too much of that. Uh, but, But suffice to say that knowledge of God and knowledge of what Jesus has completed for us is paramount to us believing the promises of God for our physical well-being. So now well, let's go to verse number four here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, Peter writes, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, this word corruption to me is interesting. I immediately think of decay. The actual definition is depravity, disillusion, and deterioration. I think decay fits into that. So God has called us to a different place. Now, listen, I'm not saying that we're not someday going to die anyway. And when we do, uh, our physical bodies are going to decay, just as simple as that. So, so that's going to happen someday. But I don't think that we need to get to heaven any sooner than we have to. I think there's a lot to do here on this planet, and I think God intends for us to be here to do those wonderful things in his name. And so that's why we understand that that healing is, is a gift that we currently possess, and we need to sharpen our faith in these areas. So now consider this statement. Sickness entered the world through sin. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, there was no death. There was no sickness because there was no sin. This is Romans 5.12, and uh, uh, Paul writes here, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Okay, so we see the progression, the proliferation, if you will, of sickness and death. It began 
when Adam and Eve sinned. And what's interesting to me is in the early part of the book of Genesis, you see people living to eight, 900 years, and then the lifespans decreased so rapidly across the time frame of the Old Testament that God finally uh, told Moses that he was going to live 120 years, and then he finally said in, in Psalm that uh, we would have three score and ten, and then if by reason of strength you want to go longer, then by all means do so. So three score and ten, of course, is 70. So that's why earlier I said 70 years. I think that's a that's the bottom line promise, even though he never rescinded the 120 to Moses. So at any rate, I think this is interesting that, uh, you know, sin brought in with it as a component death, just like forgiveness and salvation in Christ brings with it the component of health and healing. So now let's go to the book of Matthew because I've been doing this tremendous study in the gospels and and, uh, it's just been very, very encouraging to my heart. Uh, I'll tell you more about that at some other, some other time when I have more time, but, but I've been in the book of Matthew, suffice to say, and there's just a lot of really powerful stuff here, particularly when I've got on my heart and in my mind uh, this concept of healing and this and the subject that I'm thinking about a lot. So let's go to Matthew 9.35. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So notice here, and I'm making this, what I'm doing here is I'm making this connection between salvation and healing. Now, I just showed you the connection between sin and sickness. So now let's look at this connection between salvation and and healing. He's going around all the places that he was at, cities and villages and synagogues, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among those people. So we see here that this is a a tandem initiative. It's the gospel, and it's the demonstration of the gospel, which is very important. Um, And even the name of our ministry, Revere Network, is based in the book of Luke chapter 17, where the kingdom is now. The kingdom is in us. We are carriers of the kingdom. And that kingdom message now, Jesus was preaching that the kingdom is coming, but our message is the kingdom has come. And we are carrying the power of that kingdom in this gospel message, and it includes physical healing. In Matthew 10, verse 1 now, when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So notice now he's empowering uh, the 12. Some people say, well, that's why I don't pray for the sick or that's why I don't believe healing is for today because uh, it was just you know carried by the apostles, by the 12 disciples. Well, that was true in the in the earthly ministry of Jesus, because remember now, Jesus, before he was resurrected, was an Old Testament prophet, essentially. He was walking under the Old Covenant. His his disciples were following him under the Old Covenant, and so he had not been resurrected yet. There was no new covenant, and so he was in, he was giving them a delegated authority, you might say, to go and do the things that he did, and they indeed did those things. Uh, if we drop down to verse 7 and 8, it says, uh, he says to them, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So we see now that he's, again, tying this concept of the gospel, of the kingdom, and the, the manifestation of the freedom that that gospel contains to heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out demons. I know that sounds a little undignified for us today in 2022, but you know, we worship movie stars who pretend to have supernatural powers. These movies make billions of dollars every year, and yet we we struggle to you know, to envision a supernatural god who actually created everything that that we see. And I think that's that's too bad, and I think there's a reason why Hollywood makes those movies, and that is to uh, they don't know they're doing this, I don't believe. I think the enemy is behind a lot of it. But but I think that it's just to desensitize everybody to think that, well, this is just make-believe. There's no way this stuff could really happen. And I'm not, I'm not saying Jesus is going to fly around the sky 
but he might. I mean, it may seem that way at some point uh, when certain things come to fruition in Scripture. But my point is this, is that God is a miracle-working God. He always has been. And the manifestation of the kingdom that now has come and now lives within us uh, contains these very manifestations. And certainly nobody would, would think, if they really were considering it properly, that there's a reduction of the power or the promise of the new covenant based on the old. I mean, they're walking in the Old Testament, and these guys are seeing the miracles happen. Now, they eventually do walk in the new covenant promise as well. Uh, but right now they're under the Old Testament and we see all these things begin to happen. So just to revisit one concept there, Jesus empowered them under the Old Testament, but once the new covenant is instituted and we receive Christ and he's within us and we're within him, then we have the ability and the mandate actually to walk in his power, to believe God for for the manifestation of all these things that we see, to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, to cast out demons, uh, you know, and to and to raise the dead. So uh, there's been stories in the news in the past few years of, you know, uh, kind of a well-known Christian who had a child that died, and they were waiting a few days before the uh, internment so that they were believing God to raise that child from the dead. Everybody thought that was such a weird thing. But we read about it in the pages of the Gospels, and I wonder why and how we drifted so far to where now we just have this this academic approach to Scripture instead of this understanding that Scripture is living and breathing and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword and indeed still has the power to raise the dead. And, uh, and, but, and But I think that, that we've been so diluted in our faith and our experiences have have lied to us as well, and then we've we've sold the gospel short, in my opinion. So, if you'll remember in Matthew eight fourteen and fifteen, Jesus heals uh, Peter's mother in law. Sorry to all the Catholic brethren out there. Jesus heals Peter's mother in law, which meant he was married. Uh, and then in the very next two verses, it says, "When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses." Now, the reason I mention this passage, uh, other than just the obvious, is that we've had some comments here and there on our last. Uh, uh, few posts here, and you know, as we talked about these kind of things before, and people would say things like, "Well, maybe, maybe salvation is just about forgiveness and not about physical healing. Maybe, maybe you've got that wrong." Well, this passage right here proves that what we've been saying is actually right, uh, because he's quoting Isaiah, and Isaiah is tying this issue of physical healing back to the cross, back to Calvary. Um, so it says that all these things were happening. I'll read to you verse 17 again, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmity and bore our sickness. So not only did the cross of Calvary uh, and his blood being shed cause us to be forgiven forever, but also healed forever. And, uh, and, and in our mind as well, remember spirit, soul, and body. So, so, you know, whoever has issues with, with their mind and in psychological and psychiatric issues, God has made a promise that those are covered under the blood. And these things are very, very important. Um, Romans 2, 11 says that God is no respecter of persons. In Acts 10, 34, Peter basically says the same thing, that with God there's no partiality. What does that mean? That means that if one person is healed in Scripture anywhere, then God intends for us all to be healed, you know, as as we walk out our covenant. So for us to start saying, well, you know, that was just those people and you can't take those things out of context— I understand context, but also we also understand the record of the new covenant. And when somebody's getting healed, then that means that we can get healed. That means we can receive the manifestation of healing in our body because it was purchased for us already on on Jesus's cross. Now, here's something interesting about Isaiah, who, by the way, lived about 700 years before Jesus did, and he wrote many prophecies. And it seems like the writers, these disciples that wrote the Gospels, went out of their way 
to, to tie what Jesus was doing with what Isaiah wrote. So the book of Isaiah is quoted nine times in the book of Matthew, six times in the book of Mark and Luke, six times each, and then four times in the book of John. And so we see that there's this, this fantastic tie-in to the prophetic scriptures about who Jesus was, who he was going to be, and what he was going to do for all of us. And I think that's a very, very important part of what the gospel is, and that is it's, it's a promise that was made long ago. It began, the first promise of Jesus was Genesis 3.15, and we see in the culmination of his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, we see the fulfillment of those promises. So now, uh, we've looked at the tie-in of sin and sickness. We've looked at the tie-in of, of forgiveness and salvation and healing. Now, let's look at faith and healing and how these things tie together. What we believe matters, and I think this is where the enemy gets us in checkmate a lot because we don't really know what to believe at times because we're basing everything off of how we feel and the experiences that we have had. But I, I'm i presenting to you today that we should let the Word of God be our measuring stick and not our experiences or how we feel about something. You were never designed to let your feelings lead you. You were designed as a spirit being primarily to lead your feelings based on the Word of God. And so let's go to, to, again, Matthew, and we're going to talk about some instances of God or Jesus healing. Matthew 8, 5 through 13, Jesus healed the centurion's servant. Now, if you remember, he healed that servant based on the centurion's faith. In Matthew 8, 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. Uh, and his servant was healed the same hour. So that's an important point because Jesus could have said, well, I'm Jesus. Uh, you know, Isaiah wrote a lot about me. A lot of the Old Testament prophets did. Uh, and I healed you because I'm amazing. That would be true. But that's not what he said. He said, because of what you believe, you've received your request, essentially. Okay, let's go to Matthew 9. The woman with the issue of blood was healed after 12 years, according to her faith. Uh, Matthew 9, 22, but Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Now listen, 12 years is a long time. Uh, so there's no condemnation if it's, if it's taken you a while to manifest your healing. Uh, there's no condemnation in that because it's likely not going to be 12 years. I mean, Abraham, the father of our faith, according to, uh, you know, many scriptures in Galatians 3 in particular, it was 25 years for him before he manifested or saw the manifestation of the promise God made to him and his wife. So I don't think we can put time frames on this. We, this is relationship-based, remember. So we're trusting God that his love for us and that his word that speaks to us is going to sustain us until full manifestation of what we're believing for actually does happen, okay? And, you know, let me say that a lot of people will say things like this. Well, well, how, who do you think you are that you're not supposed to be sick or you're not supposed to be hindered by certain things here and there? You just think that God is your, you know, get out of jail free card. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whenever the Bible makes a promise to us based on what Jesus completed in our place, we should stand fast in that place of covenant and believe exactly what the word says is ours. And if we don't, then, you know, ultimately we're the ones that suffer in the interim. I mean, of course, we're going we're gonna to win anyway when we get to heaven, but, but God's got things for us to do here, lead our families, preach his word, uh, heal the sick and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's important that we do know what the word says and that we believe what it says, okay? So now let's move on to Matthew 9 again. Jesus heals not one, but two blind men. And again, it's based on what they believe. So in Matthew 9, 28 and 29, it says, And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Because they had already told him they wanted to be healed out on the road. And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Friend, what if he said that to us? Where, what would we get if it was according to our faith? Uh, do we believe in, uh, you know, Iron Man, but not Jesus? Do we believe in Captain America, but not Jesus Christ of Nazareth? I mean, where is our faith? And, and frankly, it's what we put time into. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a works guy at all. 
I'm a relationship guy and I'm a grace guy. But let me say this. If you know Jesus died for you, spilt his blood for you, walked out of an empty tomb for you so that you not only could be forgiven but be healed, but you're not spending any time in your word renewing your mind to those promises, you know, it's not his fault. Uh, And I think he gets blamed a lot of times for us not receiving what he said was already ours because we're not spending any time renewing our mind, putting the word in our heart, standing fast on the truth no matter how we feel or how it looks. Uh, It looks like the devil's running up the score on us sometimes, and we're supposed to stand still, stand firm in covenant blood, knowing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's never going to leave us, and he's never going to abandon us and forsake us, okay? So let's just review here real quick. Number one, and I think we've proven this today, God wants us well. That's his will for us. You say, well, if it was God's will, it would happen all the time. That's not true. The Bible clearly teaches that it's not his will, that it is his will, rather, that all would repent and come to a knowledge of him, but they don't. People die without Jesus every day because we get a choice. Um, That's just the long and short of it. Number two, there's a connection between salvation and healing, and there's also a connection between sin and sickness. I showed you that. And again, I... um, Matthew 8, 17 that I read to you quotes Isaiah 53, verse 4, and 1 Peter 2, 24, okay? So that ties physical healing back to Calvary's cross. So redemption is not just to get you to heaven. It is to give you uh, healing, body, soul, and spirit here, or spirit, soul, and body more accurately here on earth, okay? And then number three and lastly, it matters what we believe, Friend, the Word of God can be taken literally. It can be trusted. It should be consumed daily. You should have a regular diet of taking in the Word of God. You should have a journal. You should be writing. You should be memorizing. You should be engaging the Word. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We should be engaging the Word of God every day because, listen, the devil is very good at his deception He's lied to us for a long time, and again, we've been taught to rely on earthly means, and I have nothing against that. I mean, God's not against doctors, Uh, He's not, but but He wants you to operate in faith and be led by peace. And so, if the peace leads you to to a physician, there's no condemnation in that. Uh, But we believe that He brings about the outcome. But there's times. I mean, if you look at the numbers of of people who die because of malpractice. I would suggest whatever we do, we need to do in faith, okay? So we're not just saying uh, because it's not just a miraculous thing. Even if you go to a doctor and they help you, believe me, that's a miraculous thing that God needs the glory for. And so at any rate, healing is part of your covenant. Healing is God's idea for us, and healing is something that you can thank God and receive Instead of feeling like you're in a position where you're trying to get what you don't have and you're trying to line up all the dots and you're trying to line up all the stars and you're trying to say the right thing and think think the right thing and all of that, I would just simply suggest to you that healing is already yours and Jesus has already accomplished it. And what we need to do then is see ourselves in a position of authority and a position of already, um, you know, obtaining this promise and the enemy's the one trying to lie to us and trying to steal from us and we just simply stand fast and don't allow that to happen and we trust what the word of god has to say amen well listen that's all of my time today thank you for being with me and we'll continue this uh, on another episode right here at revere network god bless you Thanks for tuning in today. Check out this playlist on healing that we made for you.